Greetings and salutations. Today we will be covering the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Mystery. This strange and mysterious tale starts on the west coast of Scotland, where there is a small series of islands known as the Flannan Isles, with one of, if not the largest, single island being Ellen Moore Island. Now, around 1899, a very large lighthouse would be built on Ellen Moore Island as a way of signaling sailors who were coming to port. The mystery of the island truly begins on December 7th of the year 1900, just after the new relief comes in order to restock the island with a new set of wikis. At any one point in time, there are at least three workers on the island who work on the lighthouse. This is a year-round job. They work in two-week shifts, and the structure essentially went as follows. There would always be three people on the island minimum, and every six weeks, someone gets to take a break, and they are rotated out. So, on December 7th, when they were to make the rotation, and the new wikis would come to stay at the lighthouse, the lighthouse keepers would be James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and William MacArthur. It must be noted that this setup means that there were three men in the lighthouse, and that those three men should not come in contact with anyone else for two weeks, which would be during the next rotation. Now, something strange would be noted on December 15th, when a transatlantic steamer was coming into the port of light from Philadelphia. They noted that they did not see the light from the lighthouse. After docking in Lyth for three days, news of the lighthouse being off would be passed to the Northern Lighthouse Board. As you could imagine, it does raise some eyebrows, since it defeats the purpose of a lighthouse if it's not lit. Lighthouses are supposed to be on at all times during the night, even during the clearest of nights. This is because a ship might not see the island in time to stop, slow down, or change course, and might end up crashing into it. That means that the lighthouse not having its light on is a really, really bad thing, which means that either something happened to the wikis, or they were unbelievably irresponsible. It would not be until December 20th, the day that they were supposed to be rotated out, that a relief ship by the name of Hesperus, along with its captain, Jim Harvey, and his crew would make an attempt to get to the island. However, mysteriously enough, there was an uncharacteristically dense thicket of fog. This fog prevented them from reaching the island until the 26th. Now it must be noted that back on December 7th, when the original three wikis were rotated in, there was mention of a fog starting to settle in the area. And on December 20th, that fog had gotten so bad that it made the journey to the island impossible. When the relief boat actually got to the island, they were pressed into going to the east dock, where they quickly spotted several boxes along with supplies sitting on the dock. These had not been brought into the lighthouse, which raised some questions. Even more suspiciously, there was no one to greet them there or even signal them in. The fact that the lighthouse was derelict in its duties by not having someone to look out for ships that were coming into port from the coast, along with having no one to raise the signal flags, was rather worrying. Ship Captain Jim Harvey shot a flare due to how strange the situation was, and even went as far as to sound the horn. However, no one would come to meet them or answer them in any way, shape, or form. Due to this, they made the decision to send a small landing party to shore with relief, including lighthouse keeper Joseph Moore to look into the event. Once he got up to the lighthouse, he was met with the lighthouse gate, which was closed shut, along with the front door, and supposedly he was met with three astoundingly large blackbirds, which were perched on a cliff, staring directly at Moore. He felt as if it were that they knew something as they looked right at him. One of the first things he noticed once he reached the inside of the lighthouse was that the table was set for a meal that had never been eaten, and a chair had been toppled over. Just a singular chair. A canary in a cage was the only sign of life in the entire lighthouse, or island, aside from the three blackbirds he saw. Returning to the eastern landing, Moore reported his findings to the captain of the Hesperus. Strangely enough, he noted that every single other door in the lighthouse had been closed. None of them were open. However, once looking into the rooms, it would be found that all the beds had been left unmade. This made it seem as if there had been someone in the middle of eating at the lighthouse, and they had been just going about their day just before vanishing. 
leaving everything lying, just as if they had never even been there. The landing party also made note that all the clocks had been stopped. However, as spooky as it sounds, in reality, it is significantly less creepy than it sounds. Clocks at the time functioned rather differently than they do today. They were required to be manually wound, which meant that rather than anything supernatural having happened, the clocks had just not been wound for a long enough time to stop functioning. Yet another thing that raised flags, which was out of the norm, was that are the three men who had been staying in the island as wikis. One of them had left their coats behind. This was worthy of note due to it being Northern Scotland during December, which meant that the waterfront would be rather cold, meaning that it is very unlikely that someone would go out into the cold without wearing their coat. The coat being left hanging by the door meant whoever left it did not originally intend to go outside, but rather would have gone out in the rush. It would be then, after noting this, that the landing party would get in touch with the rest of the relief party in order to conduct a full search of the entire island. Captain Harvey sent out another two sailors to shore so they and more could begin looking for signs of life or signs of what had occurred, whichever came first. Now, one of the first places where they would look and find something that would actually help them further their investigation would be the West Dock. This is where they would find some rather strange things. The West Dock appeared to have been completely eviscerated and nearly destroyed beyond repair. Whatever had wrecked it had done so with enough force that the thick iron railings on the side of the path had been bent and twisted out of shape. Part of the railway track had been torn from its concrete setting along with having a huge rock which weighed more than a ton displaced and thrown about as if it were a pebble. Turf had also been ripped up from the tops of the cliff and thrown hundreds of feet above sea level. To put this into perspective, there is at least one study that shows with wind speeds up to 115 miles per hour do not tip over vehicles. However, passing the 115 miles per hour mark and when touching the 180 miles per hour, you start having effects on vehicles and items such as this. So the winds would have had to been rather extreme to have bent the iron bars or ripped anything purpose built to remain on a dock out of its concrete settings. Now, while going through the first wiki's logbook, there were mentions of the West Dock needing repairs. However, the problem with this is that the repairs were not made to seem anything more than the usual and there was definitely not anything mentioned about damage to the extent of what the landing party saw. The repaired mentions appeared to be more similar to that of normal maintenance. This would mean that from the time that the last logs were made that the west dock would have deteriorated significantly. And stranger still is that the east dock was nearly pristine when compared to the west dock. This log was made even more important once they realized that it had a day-by-day -day account of what happened on the island proper. This included readings of barometric pressure, ship sightings, along with noting the nearly all-consuming fog that had prevented the relief party from originally coming ashore, along with what was noted in the logs as very turbulent weather conditions. Here is where things start to become strange, because while yes, the island is a rather long ways offshore, it is not far enough to have completely independent weather patterns from the shore. And it was close enough to the shore to allow an individual whose job was to make certain that the lighthouse was functioning with the naked eye. However, this individual reported no storms occurring within the time period. Neither had anyone else outside the island proper. This begs the question, if there were this massive storms mentioned in the logbooks that caused so much destruction to one of the piers. Why had no one else mentioned them in any way, shape, or form? The individual whose job was to watch the lighthouse and make sure it was visible, or at least the light from the lighthouse was visible, would say that it was only actually visible on the night of the 12th, and that every night aside from that, he was unable to even make out the island, much less anything else such as the lighthouse or the light itself. Now, it is within the assistant wiki's log that things start to get rather interesting. And while accounts within it are impossible to validate, it is still a source that should be accounted for regardless. The assistant spoke of how the storms were getting progressively worse every night, 
which lines up with the official logs saying that the storms were getting worse. Now, this log mentions that the storm was getting so bad it was causing all of the men to begin to pray, along with stating that the men had begun to cry due to not knowing what they were going to do. In essence, they were both panic-filled and felt nothing but despair. This was the headspace that the men would be in when the final log recordings were done. The last entry, however, of the original logbook was made at 9am on December 15th. This was the original night where the boat passed and noted that the light from the lighthouse was not visible, meaning that the boat was close enough to notice, or should have been close enough to notice, the extreme weather that the wikis were experiencing. However, the only entry that day from the second wiki's log was that the storm had ended, the sea was calm, and God is overall. After that, there would be no more entries, and the crew of the Elaine Moore Lighthouse would never be seen or heard from again, alive, dead, or otherwise. However, currently, there is the story that the three men's souls became that of the three crows that stalk the islands. There's also those who note that the Flannan Isles area has been rife with legends of sea monsters, sprites, along with other supernatural and mythological beings which tormented humanity. However, there are proponents of the theory that the men were judged or they were unknowingly interacting with a greater power, potentially the divine. This is due to the strangeness of the fog that blocked any form of sighting from the shore. The severe thunderstorms that were not witnessed by anyone around the area or anyone who was outside of the island proper, along with the statements of the prayers of God and being followed by them disappearing in a manner somewhat reminiscent of the story of Enoch, whose story goes like this. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now this is all just conjecture and potential new myths forming. However, there are more plausible theories such as the one proposed by the captain of the ship himself, which goes as follows. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that. It was after reaching this conclusion that Captain Harvey sent a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board after the Hesperus reached port. Authorities would not reach the island until December 29th, and the individual who was sent was the board's superintendent, Robert Muirhead, who quickly began his investigation into the lighthouse keeper's disappearance. Muirhead should be noted as having known all three missing men personally, so he would have a reason to be rather thorough with his examination. Examining the oil skin, which was the coat, that had been left behind, he quickly reached the conclusion that it belonged to William MacArthur. He would then proceed to go over the wreckage on the western landing. Mirhead, after a heavy and thorough investigation, went on to speculate that Marshall and Ducat must have headed out into the storm to try to secure the equipment stored there. This is when Mirhead believed that they would not return, and then MacArthur must have ventured out to try and find his co-workers. Mirhead concluded his report, which would be the official report of the events, by stating, I was satisfied that the men had been on duty up until dinner on Saturday the 15th of December, that they had gone to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, etc. were kept, and which was secured in a crevasse in the rock about 110 feet above sea level, and that an extra large sea had brushed up the face of the rock had gone above them and coming down with immense force had sweeped them completely away. Regardless of the official report and examination, there are many who refuse to let go of the more fantastical possibilities, regardless of however plausible they may be. Sadly, even with the official report of the fates of the three wikis, James Duquette, Thomas Marshall, and William MacArthur, we will likely never be exactly sure under which precise circumstances would the three meet their fate. However, this fate has given them a form of immortality, in a sense. They are now as much a part of the myth and mythology of the sea as any other nautical tale. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.